Welcome to The Rest is Politics, Question Time, with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And Alistair, you, you seem to be back in London, is that right? I am. I'm in London. I'm in my house. There's a very beautiful blue wall behind you. Thank I... you. Yeah, blue wall, as opposed to the red wall. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, now, why don't we start with one in Perth and Kinross, Rory. Laurie Hughes. Ooh. I manage a busy food bank in Perth and Kinross, close to home, Rory. Mm-hmm. It's the cost of living crisis, and yet only a handful of elected officials have ever engaged to ask what we're seeing and hearing. Why is there not more interest in poverty, and how should I call this out? I hear this a lot from people who are involved in that sort of thing. That they, Yes, people are aware of the existence of food banks, but when you look at our politics and our media, you don't really see that much focus on what it is like to be so poor that you're having to you know, regularly rely on handouts from food from other people and organisations. You're you're completely right. And obviously Labour talks about it more than the Conservatives, but even Labour doesn't talk about it as much as as you'd expect. And I think it's it's something that I noticed when Ed Miliband was Labour leader, because I think he was talking about the the squeezed middle. Yeah. And it, it's partly about electoral politics, isn't it? That that um these parties are competing for the majority of voters. And I think the, the, the challenge in British society is the kind of, let's say, 7 10% of very poorest people in our country who are often in really horrible situations. Some of them are young, some of them are poor, poor elderly, obviously the homeless, um, and for, for me, people coming out of prison, um, get very little focus partly because often those are communities that vote less than other people. Mm, mm. In case of prisoners, of course, they're not allowed to vote. Yeah. Um, and it's a real test of our society, whether we are properly looking after people. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that Labour will increase support. A lot of it is actually cash support. I'm a real believer in cash, as you know. I don't think we should be giving out food. We should be giving cash to people so that they can buy their own food. But that, but that, if you think about the number of people who are using food banks now, you're talking then about increasing universal credit and other benefits on a scale that, that at the moment, Labour are not proposing at all. Yeah, but we, we absolutely have to do it because it's very, very, inef- very inefficient to be giving people food. Partly because I, I, I saw, saw in, um, I went to visit a food bank um, in the Northeast and some people are selling the food which they've been given out the back. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this is a criticism. In some ways, they're forced to. You know, these yeah. are people who are really short of cash. Uh, but it's something that we see in the developing world too, that if you only give people food and people have other needs, they'll try to turn that food into cash. Mm. It's much more efficient to give them cash mm. in the first place. Similar theme, Sam Carlyle. Keir Starmer has talked about his brother having learning difficulties. This is a, something that's in the, this new biography by Tom Baldwin. Why is the biggest minority in the UK, disabled people, not a bigger element of policy decisions and announcements? I guess that is another area, isn't it, where we, you know, we all know people who struggle with various forms of, of, of disability, and yet, again, it's not really a big central part of the political debate. It's, it's true. Um, and my, my sister has Down syndrome, yeah, and I, I think about it a lot, and I worry, obviously, about, about her a lot. And um, I mean, I have to say the, the Scottish government has been very generous and supportive, mm-hmm. and um, in the early days provided her with career mentoring and support to, to get into work. Um, but it's still very, very tough. I was watching, actually, a wonderful, very weird documentary um, called This Is Not a Horror Film, about a, written and directed by somebody who um, has Down syndrome. And it's sort of wonderfully kind of, it's called Otto Baxter. And it's a wonderfully funny, edgy, dangerous thing, because Otto is clearly a very eccentric, often outrageous young man who loves kind of dirty jokes and loves horror movies and who's put this film together. I'd really encourage people to watch What's it. What's he called again? Subject because it's called, he's called Otto Baxter and he's got, you know, he's got Down syndrome. He's got serious learning difficulties and produced this documentary called Not a Fucking Horror Story. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it's it's in which he absolutely engages in all the things that he loves um you know uh, he he loves kind of scantily dressed women he loves kind of blood on people's faces but he also tells a really moving story about his own life the way that he was given up for adoption by his mother and how he comes to terms with that how he comes to terms with the way that people look at him in supermarkets his own adopted mother who adopted four children with down syndrome so it's it's wonderful that documentary makers are engaging with these kinds of topics but i i also feel as a somebody with down syndrome sister that i'm not doing enough to make sure that fiona actually has a fully um, that she's not lonely, that she mm. has a full kind of community around her and society around her. So I, I'd love to see a government uh, leaning into this more. Mm. I, think, I also think with, with special educational needs that the issue gets looked at pretty much entirely through almost through a prism of cost as opposed to a prism of the opportunity of, you know, what, what talents can we bring out and what opportunities can we develop and give. Um, and, you know, you, we, I think it was at Warwickshire Council recently, there was some pretty unpleasant points being made about uh, about children with, with special educational needs. So anyway, I know I, I, I've, I've just recognised the name Sam Carla. I know she's a big campaigner on, on special educational needs. And maybe with Keir Starmer, if he does become prime minister, having that, own, is that personal experience. Because what's important about, I think, about Tom Baldwin's book is actually it does sort of relate a lot of what's happened in Keir Starmer's childhood and early life and his early adulthood into the kind of person and politician that he's become. So I don't think we should underestimate those kind of personal experiences in people's lives. It's like, you know, the fact that you took that question immediately to a personal experience of yours, your sister, and what that makes you feel about what the Scottish government does, what more you could do, etc. I think that those personal experiences in, in politicians' lives have more impact sometimes than we realize. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I think that the book is interesting, isn't it? Because it also talks about his strengths and his weaknesses and the way that he felt under a lot of pressure at home and that's probably created a more guarded personality. Mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Your turn. Well, here's one for me that Cassie Garbutt, is Rory getting grumpier on the leading interviews? It seems to coincide. Oh, Rory, I want, I want to ask that one. I mean, go but... on, ask, go on, ask it then. <laughs> no, no, well, you've asked it now. Go on, you carry on then. Yeah. Is Rory getting grumpier on the hashtag leading interviews? It seems to have coincided with his moving back to the UK from Jordan. Also, what's Rory's new US job? Thank you. So, um, Second question. First, I'm my new US job, I'm teaching at Yale University. I teach a course called Grand Strategy, which is, so last week we did the Afghan war, week before Vietnam, uh, taught British Navy in the 18th century, teach ancient Greek wars. It's, it's a way to look at the integration of political, economic, military strategy through history and time, uh, a seminar for students. Um, am I getting more grumpy? By the I way, by I the way, Roy, be... this question, I spotted this question as yeah. well. This question came in before the interview with Jamie Rubin went out. So this grumpiness is being picked up even before the one where you got quite grumpy. And meanwhile, you're becoming ever more kind of zen and calm, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know about that. Although Jamie Rubin, I went for a cup of tea with him after our interview and he and he said, yeah, I was kind of expecting, you're usually the one who beats people up and I thought well, you'd be beating me up. And, but in fact, you were, you were really kind of calm and zen, as you say, and Rory got quite spiky. But I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm that much more zen than I've ever been, but... I maybe I, I thought I thought it was a good interview. What I like about um, spiky exchanges, I don't think you were grumpy. I think you you were quite challenging, and I think he got irritated because he thought you were being the classic cynical Brit about American power. And and it's true what you say. If you remember, Rory, in the interview, people should listen to this. Um, he did actually say, in answer to one of the early questions, America is not nearly as powerful as it used to be. He said that when you made that point. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was like, how dare you say America's losing its power anyway I thought you both handled yourselves perfectly fine I, I wouldn't get I, 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 either you or him I wouldn't get worried about him but are you are you getting grumpier back in Britain that's a good question I, I, I think it's been a, quite a relief getting back to the States I, I found coming back to Britain actually from Jordan has been tough um, it's um, I, I, I found it very difficult kind of getting stopped on the street and people sort of saying you need to go back into politics and the kind of weird projections about that, but that's more psychological drama than, mm. than maybe we need on question time. Right. Um, here's a, a question uh, for you. Paul Dawson, 
What role could you envision for Britain on the global stage that is both ambitious and realistic, contributes to make the world safer and better, inspires widespread patriotic private in the UK, and can be implemented at various scales, irrespective of the next US president or political changes in European countries? Well, Alistair, that's quite a question. I Well, first of all, we've just plugged uh, a leading interview that's already gone out. Let me plug one that will be coming out in the coming weeks, and that is with Anthony Gormley the great British sculptor, Um, because I think one role that you could envision for Britain on the global stage that is ambitious and realistic um, does relate to this notion I have that we should put arts and culture at the centre of a bigger strategy for uh, projecting Britain to the world. I do think we have to rebuild some of the relationships that we've damaged. I do also think that we have to think more seriously about our role as a defence power. I think we talk the talk on it at the moment without delivering it. Um, And I think we could rebuild our reputation in the world of aid and development as well. But I think a combination of those things, and to be absolutely frank, getting back to some clear, sensible, grown-up leadership would be good. Good. I mean, it's... it's it is, it's a brilliant question. I love the way that Paul Dawson, whoever Paul Dawson is, has articulated that. Ambitious, realistic. Pride. Making the world safe and better, but also inspires widespread patriotic pride. Mm. Implementing of various scales, irrespective of the next US president or political change in European mm. countries. I mean, I, my, my rule of thumb on this is to think about Britain as a country like France or Germany. Mm-hmm. So a, a big power, but not a superpower. And I think we should be focusing internationally on places like Africa, because I think we can have much more positive influence there. I think our development budget can make much more difference. We have strong historical ties, and Africa really matters. As I keep saying, you know, one in 10 children born in the world will be born in Nigeria by 2050. And I think that one of the mistakes Britain has made is to fantasize that it can be a major player in India or China, it, it can't really. Mm. But I was I was looking at what the British Embassy has been doing in Kenya recently, and it's really remarkable. I think, you know, along with other people, and a lot of it is the Kenyan government, they have played a big part in bringing green investment into the country, um, supporting the stock exchange, getting tech investment in, in a way that I don't think would be possible in many other parts of the world. We've got a lot of questions this week about the talking my thing about the arts, uh, from one from Sarah G. What are your views on the cuts to culture budgets by local authorities, Suffolk, Knox, Birmingham, etc.? cetera? How, how can we best argue for reinstatement? Rather more provocatively, Lisa Olson, do you think that Birmingham City Council, in totally decimating, defunding all of the arts organisations and most of the libraries, will reap any benefits from having a city totally devoid of cultural offerings? But the short answer to that is, of course, no. I saw Andy Street... Um, yeah. The West Midlands Metro Mayor had a piece in one of the papers at the weekend where essentially blaming the city council. You, if you remember, Rory, when we interviewed him with Andy Burnham, that was the day that this 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 um, crisis was was coming to 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 a head. Um, they've now had to make these terrible cuts. It has been related to past spending decisions, but I think it is a worrying signal that people think that arts and culture are the easy first place to go. Now, none of these places are easy for cuts, but they, they feel they can get away with it more. And I think that is relating to, to Sarah's question. That is because we don't, and this is why Anthony Gormley was so wonderful when we were talking to him, you know, it's not enough to say the arts can be uh, a source of funding, a source of tax revenue and so forth. It's actually about what benefit we can bring to ourselves and to our communities by understanding the broader importance of the arts per se. And I, so I, I, I do see this as a very, very, very short-sighted approach. Yeah, it's, it's, it, and, and of course, it's, it's challenging, isn't it? Because the city council would say that they've been starved of money by the central government, but they are a Labour Labour council. So I, I guess it's, yeah. Yes. Um, now, here's a question that's come in uh, from Nicole, should we be worried about Sir Paul Marshall, who co-owns GB News, potentially purchasing the Telegraph and Spectator? So, oh my God, Sir Paul Roderick Klukas Marshall. According to the Sunday Times Rich List, he's worth six hundred and thirty million pounds. Well, I think he's a very, very dangerous person. Um, 
He's, he's very weird because he was a lib, big Lib Dem donor, gave them £200,000, stood unsuccessfully to be a Lib Dem MP. So it's a bit like the Liz Trust journey. Mm. And then became a big Brexit supporter. If anybody goes to central London and walks from Sloan Square up Sloan Street, you can see his office on the left-hand side. It's got this enormous wooden elephant. I mean, larger than a real elephant oh. on the ground floor, poking forward onto the street where his office is. And I... I, I yeah, gone. Well, he has had a bizarre journey because I, 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 there are many, many reasons why I wish Charles Kennedy was still alive. But one would be to find out what has happened to this guy since he was – because he worked as a researcher for Charles back in the 80s. Uh, he stood for Parliament as a Lib Dem. So how has he gone yep. from being he, – he co-edited the, the, the famous Orange book, which was the sort of Nick Clegg – Ed Davey, David Law's approach to liberal yep. democracy, uh, gave money, as you say, and then started giving money to, oh, he's at the center of all these stories, Michael Gove. Um, and then there's now- well, that, that's, that, that's, how I, that's how I first came across him. So when I was running uh, for the uh, party leadership against Boris Johnson and against Michael Gove, I was invited by Paul Marshall to dinner at this office with this huge elephant. So Marshall is- You had dinner um, with the elephant? Very successful. Dinner, with, dinner with Marshall himself. So he's, he's, as you say, he's this interesting history. He um, is also an evangelical Christian. He mm. supports um, a church called Holy Trinity Brompton. And I described actually in, in my book what this dinner was like, because it turned out to be a kind of Michael Gove endorsement dinner. And- it was an odd combination of very conservative views, sort of pro-Brexit stuff, but also very unconservative views. So very kind of Lib Demi. I think they were basically skeptical about the monarchy, were all about taking land away from the dukes, um, kept asking, you know, why is the British army less good than the Israeli army? Why is British agriculture less good than Israeli agriculture? Was um, And it was a Michael Gove fan club, was Paul Marshall at the center of it. But he also seems to like Jordan Peterson, who's this, um, yeah, kind of right wing uh, shock jock Canadian professor. Um, and the things that he's been retweeting, I'm just just to kind of read a little bit of them. Um, he's retweeting stuff saying, uh, Sadiq Khan is taking the piss talking about diversity. There's no diversity in a Muslim ghetto or in a Muslim society. The Muslim bloc vote that keeps them in power will vote Labour until they can vote Muslim. So he's clearly become very, very much part of the um, weird uh, kind of idea that Islam is jihadi and it's got to be taken off. He, he liked one that said, if we want European civilization to survive, we need not just close the borders, but start mass expulsions immediately. We don't stand a chance unless we start that process very soon. So that's quite a thing to like a tweet that says, that's, that's in January, right? this is four weeks ago. Well, I saw, I, w yeah, when I, when I pointed out some of this stuff on social media and Andy Wigmore, who is Aaron Banks' right-hand man and one of the sort of self-styled bad boys of Brexit, he said, well, I like some of your tweets. That doesn't make me a sort of raving lefty. Um, but I think you, I think, but, I think. But, but does he, does he tweet, does he, but what, what of your tweets does he like? Because my guess is that he's liking tweets of yours that he agrees with. He's not liking tweets of yours that he disagrees exactly. with. Exactly. So this, so this guy is actually saying that he has this, this kind of very, very, and this is the view of Islam that we talked about on the main podcast. And of course, let's just, if we think about the Lee Anderson thing recently, um, it, it was, it arose because he was speaking on GB News, paid for out of the money from GB News in which this guy invests millions of pounds. And it's perfectly clear he is investing this, this money in GB News. It's losing a lot of money, clearly doesn't care because it's giving them a platform for the views that he wants to push. Now, that is why I guess there is a little bit of a worry over this guy further extending himself into the right-wing ecosystem by becoming a, the owner of the, of the Daily Telegraph. So he's clearly one of those guys who's gone down the political route as a Lib Dem, failed, didn't get elected in the places that he tried to, and has now decided there's a better way to power where you don't have to stand for parliament or any of that stuff. You get into this right-wing media um, 
ecosystem and you become a big player within it. And here you and I, here we are, we're talking about it. He's probably very happy about yeah, that. The, the Twitter sphere is interesting too. I I'm, um, uh, retweeted Scaramucci, uh, who if people haven't listened to, they've got to listen to on leading, um, but retweeted him talking about the fact that nobody who's been in Trump's cabinets endorses Trump. Yeah. Nobody's worked with him closely endorses Trump. And the replies I got, negative replies, and I, it took me into this world very clearly. So if I go through the people that were attacking me, the same people who are attacking me for attacking Trump are people saying a US coup should not be out of the country question mm -hmm. in Britain. Um, people who are reposting, lighting their cigarettes with a leaf of the Quran, reposting a simple question, do you want Britain to be Muslim or Christian? Um, posting images of pedophile Pakistani pediatricians, or posting images whenever um, young black men are committing a crime, implicitly implying that all the crime is, is driven by black people. And, and it's really, I mean, you, you get a sense, I, I'm trying to work out which of these are bots, which of these are fake accounts, but there's a whole universe of stuff that's very, very uniform. That is why we shouldn't treat this stuff lightly. And I do, th I mean, what, you know, what is Ofcom doing? How can you have in an election year a TV station that it calls itself GB News and which Ofcom says is not a news channel and therefore not subject to the same rules as the other TV channels, which has now a succession of very right-wing voices, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Lee Anderson, Boris Johnson, all these sort of people, the MPs amongst whom you'd think would have enough to do as MPs. But this guy is clearly decided. He's a very, very wealthy guy. He made his money through, through hedge funds. When he, he, he founded um, something called Marshall Waste, which is one of Europe's biggest hedge fund groups. He's got bags of money, and he's using it to build, to allow himself to have views represented, which, fair enough, you, you're entitled to believe in those views, but let's not pretend that they are anything other than pretty extreme. The other worry I have about this guy is that He's a, I, th I don't know if he still is, but he certainly was the chairman of ARC Schools, which is one of the big providers of, uh, of academies. So, you know, I think, I think we, the, the thing that we should have learned about the history of British media is that this capacity to be both player and spectator, but only be judged by the rules as though you were a spectator rather than a player, I think that has to change. Rupert Murdoch, to my mind, and you know, we were as responsible as this for anybody, but um, was allowed to amass far too much power as an unaccountable individual within our political system. And Marshall is trying to do the same right now. Very good. Um, question from Richard James. I have to admit, but I still get confused between a customs union and the single market. Would it be possible to explain this? So quick explanation. Customs union is what Turkey is in. And it's a free trade agreement with the European Union. So there are not uh, tariffs and quotas if you send goods between Turkey and Europe. And the disadvantage of a customs union is that it means that you're tied into all of Europe's free trade deals around the world. Single market is what Norway's in. So these are ways of being close to Europe without being in Europe. And that means that you accept the four freedoms, including free movement yep. of people. Correct. We discussed this one briefly in the context of the new Polish foreign minister's speech in the UN, Steffi Laurenti. I mentioned this question, but I think it's worth going into more detail. Do you think we need a new way of doing diplomacy? I don't know what happens behind closed door, but it all sounds too robotic. Although it should remain respectful, it would perhaps be more effective to see world leaders speak their minds, even expressing frustration if they have to. And it's true this, isn't it? That when you see world leaders together, there's always an instinct to sort of want to focus on all the niceness and the togetherness. And on the one hand, you kind of, that's fine and you like that, but sometimes you do get a feeling you're not getting the the full story. I used to have this um, recurring dream because Tony Blair was absolutely brilliant at these sort of, you know, doing doorsteps, little stand-up press conferences with other leaders. And he'd always start by saying something very, very nice about the other person. And I used to have this dream about where Tony was doing one alongside Osama bin Laden. And I was dreading that Tony was going to say something nice about Osama bin Laden, and he did. 
And he started saying, you know, whatever people think about Osama, he's got this and he's got that and he likes his children and blah, 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 blah. But I think there is something about our diplomacy that is just sometimes a bit too diplomatic. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a really difficult one because it's one that Keir Starmer is going to find himself in if, if Trump becomes the president of the United States, which is how on earth do you sound normal, say the things that everybody knows that you believe while also keeping your diplomatic relations alive? Mm. Um, I mean, one of the other things that is striking is where do we drop diplomatic relations? Where don't we? You know, we've kept diplomatic relations with Russia, regardless of what they do, but we've suspended diplomatic relations with the Taliban. Yeah. Um, and that's presumably about power. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I think it's a lot of weird hypocrisy in this. Um, <clears throat> Robert Heal, just been to see the excellent Hamilton in the West mm -hmm. End in 250 years' time, 20, 2275. Which early 21st century politician story would make the best musical and be playing to 23rd century audiences? Perhaps a musical comic tragedy. Oh. There we are. Over to you. Well, Heaven knows. I mean, there's lots of people. I, I, every time I see a poster for Hamilton, have you been to see Hamilton, by the way? It's brilliant. I have. I have. I loved it. Um, but every time I see a poster, I do think about that question of, you know, because we talk so much about legacy and the legacy of politicians. And this play has become part of his legacy. I mean, I suspect that for a lot of British people, his is a name that is amongst the least known of the great you know, American yeah, founders, and, and now it's one of the best known because of this, because of this musical. Um, what would make a, what would make a good musical out of modern politics? I think Liz Truss actually. I think what will happen <laughs> with Liz Truss is that she'll be completely forgotten, and then the historians in a couple of hundred years will think, you know, what there's this amazing time in British politics when they had this woman who came along and she was prime minister like for was it three days or two weeks? I can't remember what it was, <laughs> but you should look it up on whatever Wikipedia becomes. And people say, that'd be an amazing musical. We could set it like, we could have a different song for every day that she was prime minister. So yeah, I'm going for Liz Truss. And obviously she would get a, a six-parter on the rest of this history, which will obviously still be going in 2275. But who will be presenting it? They can't both be. Are they, gonna, are, they, are they immortal? Are they immortal? They're not, they're, not, they're not hanging up their boots in the next 250 <laughs> years. It'll still, still be there. Talking to um, Liz Truss, Charlotte Hindle wants to know, what cost implication is there? to the taxpayer of having this trust speak nonsense in the United States. Am I paying for any part of this trip? Well, yes, you are in part <laughs> because ludicrously, Liz Truss gets the same former prime minister allowance as John Major, Tony Blair, etc. This is the, the costs that are deemed to be reasonable yeah. assumptions about work that you will carry yeah. on doing because you were once a prime minister. And of course, she, she also has the same level of of security as some of the, of the the former prime ministers. So up to a point, yes, but I suspect somebody else was picking up the tab for her on this one. Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll defend it a little bit because I think hard cases make bad law. Yeah. And the principle that prime ministers get some security support and some financial support makes sense. And there are very few prime ministers who last 44 days, but you wouldn't want to be changing the whole system just because of this letters phenomenon. Mm. Um, do, you think, do you think every letter should get special branch protection or not? Probably not. I think they could do with it, particularly in my house, a lot of lettuce <laughs> eating going on. Um, Lisa, is it true that MPs don't have any contracted hours or set leave allowance? If so, I imagine this leads to a lot of overworking and some notable examples of underworking. Um, well, look, I mean, Lisa's put her finger on something that's just true of the whole system. Uh, being an MP is not really a job in any normal way. There's no job description. There's no hours. You know, the, even the idea of paternity and maternity leave is kind of invented and made up. I think I took maybe a week's paternity leave, but it wasn't really leave. I mean, it wasn't in any co contracts. I just said to my constituents, I'm going to take a week off to, to be with my baby. And did you, feel, did you feel pressure only to have that one week rather than say, right, I'm going to take a few months off? Ab well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Because, you know, you know, there's another question of Clara Bamford saying, as a constituent, what can you do when your MP is suspended from their party, not representing your constituency in Westminster? My MP's crisp and blunt. We feel our voice has been silenced. How can we be heard? Sadly, we're not the only constituent situation. No, I think my constituents would have been completely outraged mm. if I took six months off because they'd be saying, you know, well, how are we going to be represented in Parliament? So it, it's, it, and, and I don't think it tends to lead to underwork. I think MPs have a lot of problems. I think 
being in parliament contorts your personality, brings out the worst bits of your personality. But their problems are not that they don't work. I think MPs work very hard, generally work very long hours. I just think the problem is the whips, the party system, the media, the incentives, the culture of parliament means that a lot of that work doesn't result in, in good results. Um, and, and I don't know how you would sort of give a job description or make it a more normal job. Mm. I don't think it's really a normal job in any no. country. Well, one thing, you, one thing you could do that I strongly believe in is I think parliament should sit much less. I think there's a lot of turning up to parliament when there isn't much legislation, there's not much to do. And actually, a lot of this is because David Cameron didn't like the fact that MPs got long summer holidays. So he invented a very expensive two weeks sitting in September before party conference, which gets absolutely nothing done, mm. but which is just about placating the idea. I, I think there are many countries in the world where MPs sit for much less of the year. And that means that I think they can get on with more useful stuff the rest of the time. Mm. I um, you remember, you may remember in, in my last book, I wrote about my nephew. Jamie Nash. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Tell us about your nephew. Well, he's just been selected as a Labour candidate. Brilliant. And, and, and the reason is, is it a, it's a, a seat that he's likely to well, win? Well, it's winnable. It's Ken Clark's old seat, but it's like um, at the moment, put it this way, if Labour are going to get a majority, he's going to have to win. But but let's try to make a desperate last ditch attempt with um, whatever it is, eight months ago to the election, to see if we can get one of these parties at least to sign up to a proper three, four week induction training. Yeah. Induction training mm. for MPs turning up. Mm. And and part of that being your stuff about Nolan principles mm. and accountability and leadership and making sure that people have a sense of the moral ideas, mm. some ideas of the expectation. I mean, and, and I'd love to see it done cross party. I'd love to see all the MPs from all parties hearing from the best of the cross party MPs who actually represent a more honourable tradition of parliament, get them when they're fresh and idealistic and, and set some standards and maybe get them to sign up. Mm. Why not sign up to a voluntary code? I mean, I, I wanted to do this when I came in after the expenses count. Why didn't we all sign up to a, a voluntary code for all of us on what we were going to do on our expenses? And I bet you had a few people saying, mm, look at these young whippersnappers come in here. We've never done that before. Yeah. Why are we doing that now? Yeah. 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 Now, listen, let's, let's get into really tricky territory as we get towards the end. A couple of questions here. One from Aine McCarthy. What do you think of Shamima Begum remaining stateless following the lost appeal against the Home Office? What does this mean? And is it common? Cameron Ratcliffe, we've now had several years of tabloid government and among the victims is Shamima Begum. Do you think an incoming Labour government should will be more compassionate in her case? Uh, I do feel very uneasy about this. Um, I think that, you know, the the, the idea that regardless i think you, you you talked earlier about you know bad case uh, bad cases making bad law um i just think that th this is a young person whatever reason gets caught up in some pretty terrible stuff admits to it but now is deemed to be stateless uh and cannot come back to the country where she was a citizen i th I, I have problems with this yeah it's it's part of a much bigger problem, isn't it? It, it? The reason why the Home Office, I think, under Sajid Javid, and we can talk to him about this when we get him on the, get him on the uh, leading, um, initially made her stateless, is that there were lots of people who'd been involved with ISIS, of which she was one, in these camps on the Syrian-Iraqi border, who they never had enough evidence to prosecute. So they'd said, they'd gone out, the government had gone out and said, anyone who goes out to join ISIS, you know, we're going to lock them mm. up. Um, obviously, Shamim Begum went out to join ISIS, and then it became clear to the government that she could come back to Britain and nothing would happen to her because mm. there wouldn't be enough evidence that she'd prosecuted, despite the fact she'd been connected with this incredibly extreme jihadi group. So the solution that they came up with was to make her stateless. And it's a little bit reminiscent of the contortions around Rwanda and all the strange legal... Mm fictions that they're doing around Rwanda. It's about governments finding that some of the things they want to do are difficult to do within the legal system, mm, mm. and then coming up with stranger and stranger solutions. So I think what's happening is a minister is sitting at a table, and it's probably in this case Sajid Javid, saying, well, surely I can't have her come back to the UK when we said anyone who goes off to join ICE is going to be prosecuted if I can't prosecute her. 
can we just stop her coming back? And eventually somebody's saying, well, I suppose you could take her passport away, which is what's now been been challenged. Um, yeah, I, I think I the challenge. I think the challenge. I think the reason why people were there was. A, I think a lot of people think that this case was, as it were, about the merits of the case. As I understand it, it was about the system that was applied. Um, so, but but I I, I I just think it's. Uh, I think it's pretty. It's pretty hardcore to say that you, you are you are now deemed to be stateless because the same principle should apply. That if you don't have the evidence that says that they are guilty of crime A, crime B, crime C, then why should there be such a severe punishment? Yeah. And and of course, that then leads back to why did the government say that it was going to prosecute anyone who went to join Mm. ISIS when in fact it didn't have the legal power to to do that? One more for me, Nick Simpson. Last week, Labour said they would use citizens' assemblies, then rode back on it within hours. This seems to happen a lot. Is this part of a strategy, floating ideas to see the public reaction? Or is it a lack of message discipline? Or maybe indecision on policy? Heartbreaking for me. Remember I said last week, I think, that that was the thing that was going get, get to get me to vote for Labour. Where was the rowing back? When I, I, I was, I, this is the first I was aware of the rowing back. I know I should read the papers more closely, but... Um, have they have they said it's not happening? Yeah, the late let's so so yeah, a Labour spokesman came out and said basically that this was an idea of Sue Gray's that it wasn't endorsed by the Labour Party and they wouldn't be going ahead with it. Oh. Um, which seems to be very sad because it, it was a very exciting moment. Mm. Oh well, we, we listen. We should keep banging away about it because we both think it's a good thing. Um, I I suspect in that case it was a lack of well, it can't have been lack of message discipline because as I understand it, this came from from the Tom Baldwin's book where he spoke to Sue Gray and she mentioned it. So, she, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, well, that's bad, bad. Bad if true. My last question, Rory, Pippa Lucy. Alistair, will you please ask Rory to come to Shay's pub with the British and <laughs> Irish student caucus after he gives his talk at Harvard next week? Well, I, I, I want to be very clear on this, Alistair. <laughs> you know, <I> think... <laughs> you, what, what do you want to be clear about? The... I mean, look, yeah, yeah, no, I no, Rory, be, you're I, talk... I just want to be very clear. I want to be very you're clear. You're talking about some Alistair. nice yeah. British and Irish students. They're out there. They're probably going to go to your talk. You just have to pop in for five minutes, do a couple of selfies, say thank you when they say how much they love the podcast and ask you what Alistair Campbell's really like, which is all they want to care. Ask you about, by the way. On, on, on those terms, I'm up for it, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Pippa, he says yes to five minutes. And David Gork, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to get the same commitment for an event in Chorleywood uh, for the excellent local bookshop. Alistair, thank you. You're, you're in very good form today. You seem to be very cheery and zen-like. Oh, I, I don't know what's so. going on in your life. Yeah, no, I thought, I thought you've been... Oh, yeah. well, that's weird because I'm really not. Oh, well, may, maybe when you're... Maybe you're just immensely self-controlled. I now feel I'm becoming the grumpy one and you're becoming... Maybe the... I should be an actor. Yeah, maybe you should I'm... be an actor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, since our revelation, which is going to be followed up soon, that we've discovered your twin, but we're not going to reveal who your ah. twin is, but it will be revealed soon yeah. on leading. yeah. Good. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.